Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a goal. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Today's RTGA podcast is still practicing physical distancing. You'll all be glad to hear. Hello and welcome along to the RTGA podcast. I am delighted to say I'm joined by Rory O'Neill as always, Donald O'Cusick and Derek McGrath. The lads are with us to discuss the all-star hurling team of the Sunday game era, the full forward line. We'll get to that shortly, but first, make sure everybody's okay. How are we, lads? Good? Very good, Mikey. Yes. Very good. Good. Um, lads, before we get on to the hurling, I think we've actually... Uh, the world seems to be stirring a little bit, the beaches of Sutton are anyway, and um, you know, there's a little bit more news around, so we might as well deal. There's one story kind of GA-wise bubbling. There's only one, and that's the, you know, the stance of the GA to kind of call pause to the 20th of July at the earliest, beyond what the government asked. Uh, we had former GA President Sean Kelly on the Sunday game questioning the logic of this and saying we might, you know, other sports can steal a march. And today, Anthony Cunningham is on the, quoted on the RGGA website, kind of Voicing his concern for his Roscommon players, saying like they're they're lost was his phrase, and they're missing human contact, you know. And you know, GA, GA players without GA uh, can feel like their life is lacking a little meaning. Might be a little bit dramatic to some people, but I think you two lads could probably understand where Anthony is coming coming from. Uh, Derek, I'll, I'll go to you first, and just where where do you lie in this twentieth of July date that's been put forward? Yeah, well, I think in fairness to John Horn. I think it's not a stagnant. He, he talked about it as being a living document. And I think the COVID-19 committee that have been established within the GA, Pat O'Neill, Dr. Pat O'Neill, Kevin Warren, Paul Flynn, and um, Jim O'Donovan, these are quality people that have been involved with teams at the highest level. So I think, I think they're actively working on, on, a, on a, a pathway, is probably the phrase now that's been used in political circles. But I think they're actively working on a pathway that will see a maybe, a, you know, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm speculating that when it's safe to return and when it's, you know, possible to, to, to be in the field. I'm not for a second, I don't think for a second that they are not thinking about, uh, you know, uh, the mental health benefits of me meeting up with their friends. Like if I was to personalise it, I have a six-year-old and a 15-year-old, both members of De La Salle GA Club, both were living in the country, both missing their friends terribly, um, you know, both missing their, 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 their club, missing the, the activity of the club. So I, I'd, I'd imagine that those people and those really good qualified people are working, as I said, on a pathway to, to see some sort of reintegration and are balancing the whole mental well-being with the ultimate safety of everybody, you know, and they're probably looking afar, you know, even if you look at Catherine Sapone's uh, comments yesterday in terms of the childcare, they had a situation where they're talking about cluster groups, you know, making sure they avail of open spaces. So I'd imagine there'll be a link between those thought processes and the GA processes going, going forward, you know. Yeah, uh, Donald, the, the GA's argument on not opening the fields, I think there's, re- there's some validity to it that, you know, you can't be asking club volunteers to police the grounds because I think we've seen in the last couple of days, like the pictures from Sutton were remarkable. And I even know just from my own uh, locality, I went down to the beach yesterday and the beach is quite enough because you get blown off it. But the park next door, there was a lot of small groups. And if they're from the same household, there's a lot of very close brothers and sisters of the same age living around Greystone. So I think it's safe to say that a lot of people have kind of moved from phase one to phase two or phase three here. And you would imagine GA club members would be the same and it would be very difficult to limit it to four lads having a puck around it at a social distance, wouldn't it? Yeah, look, and I'd echo everything Derek has said that, you know, I think that the, all the, the governing organisations have done a stellar job today, be it, you know, the, the, the government. And you can understand why the GA are taking such a conservative approach we're in uncharted waters who's going to to risk human health right Um, but the one thing i do think that that we probably need to look at is actually that thing around the uh the ga fields i'm stating the obvious here that the 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 ga field is the heartbeat of most communities in ireland definitely in rural ireland definitely in trying and where where i'm from and i do think that you know Again, can fully understand why they're being so conservative, right? And like Derek said, you can be guaranteed all the conversations that we're having here, they're having those conversations as well. And we, they don't have the luxury that we have of being the horrors on the ditch when it comes to this one, right? But the, I, do think that, I do think they need to look at opening up the fields earlier than the 20th of July, right? Um, 
And I do think that, you know, we all know that you, you can't under, underestimate the, the will and the, the, that volunteer spirit that exists in the, in the country. And I'd imagine, like, I, I do understand, they don't want to put pressure on, on clubs, they don't want to put pressure on more communities that, uh, and, uh, and, and, and committees and, all, and, and so on. But I'd be surprised if you wouldn't get a lot of volunteers that would act as, as marshals or whatever that needed to be. If it was a case for that you needed to go down to the local field for, for three hours and maybe the field, if, if, if you can get the marshals, the field would be open. If you can't get them, the field to be closed. I'd be very surprised if you wouldn't get maybe between, I don't know, 12 in the day to maybe 6 in the evening if you couldn't get a couple of people to volunteer. And of course, I know that there's risk involved in that. But look, there's, there's, there's risk in, in, involved in, in, in everything that we're doing. And the other thing that's, I think we're moving away from a point where we, we think somehow this virus is maybe going to disappear at any stage. I think we need to, to come to the realisation that it, it, it's living with with, with COVID now is, 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 is the reality going forward. Yeah. Rory, you're obviously heavily involved in your own club up in Donna Bates. Um, what do you think of that? Do you think you're a big enough club as well? Do you think you'd be able to manage it? Were you to be able to open the gates? I think that it would be difficult, certainly at, start, at the start. I think, though, I wouldn't underestimate people's um, willingness and ability to adapt as well. And you, I think there has to be an element of trust with people on that regard because... I think people will understand that if we don't adhere to what the clubs are telling us, if the clubs are enforced, are entrusted with policing this, and if they come up with a set of guidelines, for instance, we had an executive meeting in our club last Monday, and we've now appointed a COVID subcommittee within the club itself to put in guidelines and policies for when eventually the club gates are opened back up so that we can have one way in, one way out of the dressing rooms, uh, creating um, you know, safe toilet facilities for boys and girls, making sure that um, there's no crossover in training times, that there's a gap in between. If teams are uh, slotted in for nine till 10, that there's a 20 minute gap for when the next crew arrives so that there's not that big congestion in and around car parks and all of those types of things are being looked at. But I think the July 20th, the July 20th relaunch day does would have me a small bit worried insofar as I think there's a mental health aspect to this. Um, you know, like kids, whether they're teenagers or even like a lot of our players, even at adult level, would be still very young men. You know, like what are they doing to fill their days if they're not allowed to go down to the fields to train? There are other choices for them and those choices aren't necessarily great ones. Um, then there's obviously <coughs> the other factor is like, and I'm sure Derek and Don Logue would probably have this, maybe not so much in Klein, but certainly in Cork, there's your competitors. Your competitors have started to go back in small groups. Now, I know soccer is absolutely a, a different a kettle of fish because you can actually play soccer in a non-contact format fairly comfortably, certainly in a training aspect. But, you know, like, I think there's a fear now, and I'm getting that distinct fear from the coaches and the members from within our club, in here in Don, in Don Abate in Dublin, that we could lose members, we could lose players if that date do, is stuck to, and we need to maybe allow for a small bit more fluency on that. And I think, in fairness to the people in charge, they're aware of that as mm. well. Um, I want to come to you, Derek, in a minute about what Anthony Cunningham said today, because I think it's very interesting. But actually, don't know before it slips from my mind. The minors are in a invidious uh, position here as well. There might be some 17, 18 year olds happy enough not to be doing their leaving cert this year, but you had a very promising bunch of hurlers there who are probably wondering whether they'll ever have another chance to represent their county. Have you any steer yet on what's happening with that? Yeah, well, like, look, I'd be hopeful that we're going to, to, to play a championship, right? Um, and it is a special thing that you raised there, Mikey, you know, a, a person who plays minor for the county, like it's like, uh, it's like a badge of honour within our, our, our overall game. So I'm not going to lose hope that any of those young lads are going to miss out on that opportunity and in any of the, you know, the communications or contact or until, until this thing is fully ruled out, we live in hope and I, I, I live in hope uh, that, 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 that we are going to see a, a championship and that's very much the position I'm, I'm taking. Cool. Derek, you, I, I, very interested in what you would think on what Anthony Cunningham said. His quote is, I have to say the guys are the last without that interaction and personal contact. They're used to being very structured in life and training four to five times a week, knowing what is coming next. I guess it's hitting hard that everything has come to stop and the panel has been disbanded. 
Um, I was wondering what you think of that, because obviously you're not too long uh, away from it, and uh, we, we all know kind of the bond you engendered with your team. Um, how hard do you think it would be hitting the Waterford hurlers at the moment, or any inter-county team, because the commitment is huge, and people always, often look at the negative side of that, and you're well aware of that, but like they don't see that. They wouldn't be doing it if they thought it was a negative. Obviously, for them, it is a huge part of their life, and it's two months and counting now without it, and it like the mental health side of things has to be considered at this point, doesn't it? Yeah, a couple of things there, I suppose. It probably reinforces the view that Eddie Brennan had on the Sunday game last Sunday night, whereby, you know, Leash had, had down tools and, and basically Waterford had done similarly under, under Liam Cal because there's no end game, if you like, in sight. But look, flip it around and you could, you could argue that, you know, it's, it's up to management, it's up to players to be as innovative and as creative as possible in terms of maintaining the bond, maintaining freshness, giving them the structure, giving them routine, adapting to the situation as it is in front of you. So, on the mental health side of it, I'd be very strong on that because, because I suppose there's a lady actually work, working within RTE, Clean O'Leary, who, who produced a dissertation on mental health literacy, which is the ability of someone to kind of, in coaching circles, to actually read how someone is feeling, a player or, or you know, a, a member of a club, etc. And, you know, she talked about the, in, in her dissertation about the one good adult theory that is often espoused, the influence of someone within your club or in your county setup on your own well-being. And I think that, that can't be underestimated, you know. And I, again, I, I come back by saying I really do believe that the people that are involved, as I said, the Kevin Mourns, the Pat O'Neills, the Paul Flynn's, um, the Jim O'Donovan's, these are the, the best of people. And I think they'll actually be working something like Rory has already set up in terms of Don Abate, you know, a committee established. Don't ever underestimate the ability of volunteers to bring their levels of expertise from their work areas, from, from law, from medical grounds, from from teaching from uh, uh, any job whatsoever and bring their a level of volunteerism and their expertise to an area. Like even if you, you know, if we're, we're looking at a lot of professional models, we're looking at the Bundesliga and we look at the Premier League and then we look maybe at NFL. I was just reading about the commissioner in the NFL. They've set up what's known as kind of an infection response team. Now, obviously we can't do that because of the level of professionalism, etc. But already Rory has talked about a COVID committee getting ready for the steps. So I'd imagine the COVID-19 committee, GA committee, are saying these are the steps that are going to be involved and there'll be a, a filtering of educational kind of, you know, uh, if you like, an educational kind of facility for us to be, be able to kind of wise up to what's involved when we do return. And I, I do feel that that will be earlier than 20 July. And I don't think it'll be relenting to the pressure of what the likes of us are saying here as hurlers on the ditch. Mm. I think it'll be just because the, the mental health and, and the, the need for the field, if you like, will outweigh um, will outweigh other things, and and the risk will the risk we'll have to live with the risk as such, you know. And I tell you, the fields are looking good, lads. Jeez, <laughs> lads. they are looking good. I was down there yesterday. We have a rota going there in terms of security, just keeping an eye on the place, making sure no one is in there acting idiot. And I went down there yesterday. Like, even the grass and the gold now is almost like the gusta. It's just <laughs> the, place, the place is just looking yeah. resplendent, like you know. Oh Jesus! How about that, Donald? Grass in a goal mouth in a club ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. imagine that. That there's not enough foot to the to the crossbar for. for <laughs> <laughs> add inches to it. Add inches. Can we get balls over the crossbar so out there, Rory? Really. Yeah, you know, and a nice soft landing as well. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Sure, lads, we'll move on and have a look. We've, uh, we'll do a bit of escapism now after that. So um, I will show you the team that we have as of now. Um, it'd be nice to get your initial reaction to it, if you can see that. For the readers, at ho listeners at home who are not watching us, we have Brendan Cummins Gold, Brian Corker and Brian Lowe and Dermot O'Sullivan. The controversial half-back line of Tommy Walsh, Farg Maher, Brian Whelan. Midfield, Tommy Dunn, Michael Fenley and the half-forward line quite terrifying, DJ Carey, Joe Canning and Henry Shefflin. So I'll go to you first, Derek. Um, aside from JJ Delaney, who we've covered well at this point and was, again, the caveat, this is voted for by the readers, not by us. Uh, what do you make of this team? Yeah, very hard to argue with any, with any of the selections, really. And I know you've, you've, it's probably cited controversy, but it's a... <laughs> we cited nothing. Team, mixture of, <laughs> yeah, no, no, a mixture, mixture, of, yeah. mixture, mixture of everything. You know, uh, from a personal point of view, obviously, in Waterford, when we look in Waterford circles, you'll be thinking of Ken McGrath and his, mm. uh, his input on, on, on that brilliant team that Waterford are involved with. You think of Brick as well, you know, obviously, one and all-star in three different positions, you know, has huge input in, into the, the Waterford team of, of the... Uh, the 2000s and indeed later into the 2000s. So I think his longevity, you know, probably 
has and his versatility has probably seen him suffer in terms of the, mm. the picking of the team ultimately. But that's from a personal point of view. Other than that, extremely hard hard to argue with the with the with, with the team in general. You know, the movement maybe of we've gone with the Sunday game team last year when we when we went the route of moving guys near the end of the year. So we've we've even though Dermot O'Sullivan, I think he actually marked John, my own brother in law, John Milan, and one of the Munster finals early. He was sick. I think he was left corner back early in the year that that year. I think the owner might correct me if, if I'm wrong there. And obviously, I played in the minor final in '92 myself, and Brian Corkin was playing after us, on, and his hurley slipped into the in, into the stand alongside of us there. He was marking Eamon Morrissey from Kenny, so he was a brilliant adapter for the left corner back and centre back over the years. And look, I, I, I love watching Tommy Welch over the years, so that back line is, is fierce. Obviously, you look at the goalies, you'd be saying Damien Fitzhenry, you know, looking at guys that perhaps were, 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 were close to Brendan over the years, but look, Brendan is probably a, ahead of it. The three half forwards, Jesus. Like where do you go? You know, you, you could you could offer a, a competitor to them, but um, the three yeah. are, are, are unbelievable holders. You know? Yeah. Don't log your thoughts. Yeah. Look, you can't you can't argue against any of those players, right? On one level, but then again, when you look at this, all of the great players we, we we've seen over the years, that you could make a case, of course, for 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 players to to be added into that. Um, interesting one on Brendan Cummins. I I like. Brendan, to me, Jork Cunningham, Jork Cunningham was the greatest scorekeeper ever to play the game. And I know that might sound a bit Cork centric, right? But I just I just firmly believe that, right? I think Brendan was, if you like, he was like the, the Jork Cunningham, especially in the early 2000s of, 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 of Jor's era. But again, you, you, you can, an outstanding goalkeeper. Um, but just one one to flag there, maybe in any of the discussions that I've heard that uh, maybe Jor not getting the uh, the ranking that, that I would feel he deserves, albeit understanding that. Uh, that there's probably a bit of a uh, bias somewhere involved in that, right? But yeah, like Derek, you, you, you can't argue against any of the, uh, the individuals that are named there. Um, amid all the complaints about JJ not being in the team in one line or the other, a lot of the, 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 the flack we've been getting online, which is all in good fun and look, it's given us something to talk about. People are saying Jeremy O'Sullivan, now he's only there because Brian Lowen seemed like the obvious fullback. Do you think The Rock could have played a quarterback at inter-county level, Donald Oak? Well, he did play a cornerback for, uh, as, Derek, as Derek said there, he actually played a good few games mm. at, at, at cornerback. The one thing I'd say about Diarmuid, right, and again, I had a very good insight into him. People maybe have a, an image of Diarmuid grabbing the ball, busting out, hitting shoulders and stuff like that. But the man was one of the best hurlers I ever played with, like huge, very skillful, big, very, very skillful. skillful player. And uh, some of the best games that Diarmuid played was actually in the half-back line that I've seen him playing. Even left half back, I always thought was it was his best position. And as we know, you need to be a hurler to play in the half back line. But in terms of needing the skill to do it, not negotiable. Dearman had everything. Okay, right. I'm going to give you the the voting. The voting's been going on for a good while. We've had nearly twenty thousand votes on the um, the full forward line. Oh. Nearly. I'll give you the um, I'll give you the top ten, and uh, I'm so glad we've the two of you for this because I don't think me and Rory would have to say a word for this. Uh, so at 10, we have Joe Dean. At 9, we have Richie Hogan. At 8, Larry Corbett. At 7, John Milan. 6, Eddie Brennan. 5, Patrick Horgan. 4, Jimmy Barry Murphy. And the top three, <laughs> by thousands of votes, thousands of votes separating these three from the rest, Owen Kelly, Nicky English, and Jamie Callanan. <laughs> 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 so you can tell that... The, They'd be getting out to vote in their uh, thousands, I think, in the Premier County. And um, honestly, there's over 8,000 votes for those three. And JBM has about 3,000 votes. It's not even close. We can discuss this all we want. We're not going to influence things. Their ability to uh, motivate themselves and mobilize for online votes just makes Tipperary fans more likable again, doesn't it, Donald yeah, that's right. <laughs> Everybody in the Cologne and in Paris there, obviously, is there. Uh, um... <laughs> it's, it's a hell of a vote. But you would have played, you would have battled, well, yourself and Owen Kelly would have had, uh, you would have come up against Owen Kelly an awful lot. And there's not too many people who dispute. Obviously, his free taking was incredible, but close to goal as well. He was, he was pretty lethal, wasn't he? Yeah, like I'd have Kelly up there, and um, definitely no, no, no argument with that. Like he was, if you like, he was he was a forwards forward or hurlers forward had everything. Great wrist, powerful shot, left and right. You, know, you recall that 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 point he got, you know, on on the spin, could 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 mix it. Was a hugely physical player, 
was uh, looking for, for maybe a coin description here, was one of the most aggressive forwards, if not the most aggressive forward that, uh, that, that, that I would have played against. We used to be joking, and I, I, I've often said it to him since, that when, when I want to be coming towards you, like he, he, he took the dumb believables theory of make every, make every blow a funeral type territory, right? But he also had a fierce ability that none of the referees, for some reason, thought Owen Kelly was capable of it. And I can recall, <laughs> I, I can recall it more than one occasion going up to the referee saying, did you see that? And then Owen would almost an altar boy appearance like ah, RF. There was nothing in that. Never mind him. What is he on about? So on. But anyway, in terms of folks, and he's there uh, on hurling, absolutely no argument. Top class player. It must be come from being a Tipperary man in St. Kieran's or something. He had to, I'd say he had to grow up fast and he had to be hardy fast because I'd imagine he was, pro- he was probably, uh, he probably had a target on his back in his early days in school. The only unfortunate thing about him, I suppose, really, in one sense, was his peak years probably coincided when Tipperary weren't at their peak, at their strongest. You know, like he was like he would some of the hurling he was doing around the off or around when you were kind of when your team were going really well down low, around off four or five or six. That was kind of when Owen Kelly was really motoring, and you know, Tip were, I suppose, it would. Be, the thing for me is, it would be really interesting to see what an Owen Kelly would do in the current Tipperary team and how dangerous and, you know, like if you had him in alongside Shamie Cal and his peak, but I suppose, look, that's all very kind of fantasy stuff, but yeah. yeah. And that's the and what, question what, 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 he, what, he, Sorry, what he, what he had to do as well is I think he had to live with expectation all his life. I actually saw him playing in the Tony Forrestal final when he was under 14 in Waterford. It's the, it's the annual tournament in Waterford. And he was a four year minor then and he was, you know, he had to live with, been very good from being very young, almost like canning, if you like. And and some people deal with that very well, and others others don't. I was a three-year minor myself, and I only played two championship matches of Waterford, so I wasn't. It doesn't happen, you know, for for some people. And to be able to live with that expectation, I thought. I thought key influences there looked like the relationship with Nicky English was a really strong relationship in terms of, you know, when they came on those scene, those matches down in Parky Creek between when when he made his debut against Clare over the years, looked like a real kind of bond there between himself and Nicky that kind of brought that through really, really well. So, you know, living with that is not easy. And, and as just to back up what Don Logue said, I think just a hugely kind of the mix between affability, if you like, in terms of charm offensive and peak, uh, you know, teak, sorry, absolute toughness and, and rootlessness. They're just a perfect guys, if you like, you know. Yeah, it's really coming out recently though how what an absolute demon he was on the field. I've heard it come up. It's because we're looking back so much. Is the, the fact that Owen Kelly was like, a dangerous man in more ways than one on a hurling field. That's kind of that that had passed me by. I have to say, it's it's good to know. Um, Nicky English, we discussed quite a lot because he was he knew he got voted onto the team in a half forward line, which probably would have would it wouldn't have seemed right. He's 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 in the right place now, and I just remembered what I said about him. Don Logue was, I was quite young when I, when he was in his prime, and I loved hurling, but I was always terrified for Nicky English because you know his face was always he was always getting bashed up. He never wore a helmet really. He um. He was the most skillful player on the pitch, but he also seemed to be the bravest. And he used to just get, he, defenders would try to annihilate him, but it, it didn't quite work for him. He just, he struck me as, I don't know, he was, he was one of a kind in a way. He was just so brave, but so skillful. But like, like his face now tells a, a, tells a thousand words, really. he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, look, graceful. Interesting, there's a common theme coming up here, though, with all of the top forwards in terms of that you need bravery, you need courage. Um, I remember when, when you mentioned that, Mikey, I remember being behind the goals at a Limerick and Tipperary game. And I, I think it was Mike Nash. There was two Nash brothers played in the full back line for, for Limerick. And I can remember it's, it's sticking out in my mind, Nicky's ability to put his hand out, try and protect himself from behind and still focus on the ball when the Nashes were absolutely... Wearing hurlies off him. Couldn't yeah. put it better, Rory. I remember it yeah. stuck in my mind because, again, a bit like everything about Nicky was, you see all the, the highlight reels, the great skill. Like I said, he looked so graceful. I remember going to see, you know, Cork Tip games in the, in the late 80s and so on, and, and it was always Nicky English. But that day reminded me that there was more to being a great forward than, uh, than the ability to have all, all the skills you needed that other side. And like Owen, he had that in abundance as well. Yeah, he was. Uh, we... we... We might move on to others because, as I said, we really we, we did pay a lot, a lot of tribute to him in the last show. Um, Derek, you obviously would have had to make plans for Shamie Callanan. Um, 
he's a very interesting case, isn't he? Because he was obviously started out at wing forward, had his had his difficult days on big days in Crow Park, um, but has developed into the most complete inside forward in hurling, you'd have to argue. And in a time when the inside forward and, you know, kind of playing as a, not stationary, but at least a kind of, you know, your more traditional full forward, it's gone slightly out of vogue in some places, but Shamie Callanan is just an amazing exponent of that role, isn't he? Yeah, look, and even if you, I remember the 08 semi final against Waterford, he's actually at 11 that day. You know, he played centre forward that day, played a lot of us. And even this year, if you look back at some of the games, he actually starts at 11 for a lot of the games, but might spend six or seven minutes there, goes in, and, and maybe later in the game comes out if, it's, if it's, the path has been blocked up. So he's, for me, even if you look at the, if you look even at some of the, you know, Lark Horvath's autobiography, for instance, when he talks about Callan in the run up to the 10 final, he talks mm-hmm. about Callan's role not playing if in terms of, of of being a sub and, and the genuineness of of what he had said in the week of the game in terms of his impact that he was likely to have on the game etc so it's for me there's been a kind of a, a development mentally as much as anything else with, with Callan that's seen him you know come from that I won't say a bit part player but certainly his development over the last four years in particular has been noteworthy in that you know he's really become the fulcrum of the attack he's really become the main man he's really become the kind of the, 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 the fella that you can go to in times of need. And further to that, even if you look back to last year when, when Liam made him captain, for the first couple of game, league games, I think I'm right in saying that he was actually taking the freeze. And there was kind of a debate going on between ourselves and everyone. I wonder, you know, he started missing a few freeze and we were saying, Jesus, I wonder if Jason Ford a better fit on the freeze. So his ability to be able to adapt to, you know, not, not being taken off the freeze, but to lead without having that kind of, you know, I won't say fallback of the freeze, but I think he's just turned into a right leader. And I think he, he looks like a guy without even knowing him that has a different perspective on, on the games. He's just playing it for what it is as it is in front of him, living in the moment and happy to take the, you know, get the wins at the end of it. He has the rootlessness to get the wins, etc. But seems to be a very, very happy player, I think. And, and I think that's contributed to his, um, to his leadership and, and, and the way he's played outside of the way he plays. He's, he's a deadly assassin. That's what he is, you know, yeah. in terms of how he plays as well. Yeah, Rory, from a TV producer's point of view, he's a bit of a dream, isn't he? Because he just kind of... Good-looking good lad as well, which is not really like... You know, he is, he's big. tall, handsome, you yeah. know. <laughs> but he... Like, it's just kind of the way he plays the game. It, we had a piece on the site last week about kind of how hurling has developed with TV and TV has developed with hurling. He's kind of built for the super slow-mo shot. And like, some of the goals he scores, like, you can't, One against, you can't actually One against see them. In real time, you don't see them because he hits the ball that hard. He needs the super slow mo to be appreciated almost. Like the one against, I like I still marvel at the goal against against Wexford in the semi final. You know the fact that he he let it bounce. Now you can actually see him for a split second, sort of almost adjust himself and just take that extra. I'd say it's probably only about a quarter of a second, but that's what the great players do. Like they can kind of almost slow time down, even in the in in the heat, in the whitest heat of heat, they can just take that little bit of extra just to compose themselves and then to pull first time and catch it so sweetly. And like you don't you it's very rare you see a double or you know a first time pull like in the 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 the, the general kind of a Kind of modus operandi for most players is to get the ball into their hand nowadays. Like so, I mean, he just has a, he just has all the skills, and I think it was very fitting as well that he ended up part of the year because I think he was probably you know close enough to it in the past and maybe didn't get it for whatever reason. So I think it's uh, it was a pretty good year for him. All Ireland winning captain. What, how many goals did he score in the championship last year? Was it seven or eight? He got a goal in every match. I think that they played. And you know, climbed the Hogan step, climbed the Hogan stand, and picked up Liam McCarthy. So, good luck to him. Well deserved. Yeah, and um, Don Logie is he's he's. I'd be interested to know kind of the, the challenge you know you face when you're playing against a player of his his physical stature, because obviously he's got all the skills and all the ability, but it is no harm for a full forward to be built the way he's built, either, is it? Yeah, I think having having players of that that physical side can add greatly to the balance of the entire forward line because I think it's that it's that whole mix is 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 what's really important that whole connectivity that that exists between the the, the attackers and having a, a person of his size and his skill is a is a is a, is a huge asset. But if you look at all the things like the the ability to take on the man, he can stand off the man, take his points, courage. 
He's a creative course. He's a creative you know, he's very creative as well. Exactly. Playmaker who scored out with the ball that he gave to, to Bubbles in the All Ireland final. Yeah, and some some of that, you know, some of that movement that you get when the uh, when the the, the temporary forwards have that kind of that magic in their wrists when they spray the ball around uh, between each other. Um so so yeah, top, 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 top class player. A bit like, you know, I think Derek touched on it there that earlier on in his career, and it's with all these players, players mature, they get to their to their peak. Like Seamus Callanan, no, compared to Seamus Callanan five years ago, they're two totally different animals. And you could nearly say that about all of the players. Um, and when even having these discussions, sometimes it helps to, to talk about each player when they're at their peak. It gives you some chance of, uh, of measuring them a, a, against each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, the, take, take it, nobody's disputing the absolute ability of the three men who are running away with this poll. Some people might be irked by the fact that the three of them are from the same county and that county being temporary. But... Looking down the list, you know, the players who have, you know, are, are trailing in their wake, Jimmy Barry Murphy, Patrick Horgan, Eddie Brennan, John Milan, Lark Corbett, considering the temporary vote, I'm surprised Lark Corbett isn't further up, but also the likes of Eddie Brennan. Um, I suppose we might as well, to discuss this, we might as well get to what your own top threes would be. Um, Derek, have you, who would be in your full forward line of the last 40 oh, years? Jesus. <laughs> Okay, but obviously I get the bias out of the way with, with, with my, my obviously family connection to John. So, look, I just you, you know this is coming, so you kind of do a bit of research in advance of it. You know, just looking through the tar- 30 top scorers of all time in the, in the history of the championship, you know, and the only one that's in the top 30 that's not a free taker is actually John, that hasn't taken frees in the past. You know, like he scored 15 goals and 134 points, right, in, in 47 games. Oh, yeah. Which is an average of three point eight points, right? So, which is an average of no, four no, points without taking taking freeze. Yeah. without take a freeze. And I think he's been fouled for. If I was to add another, I'd add three points to, onto the for, for the amount of freeze that he's probably won for himself. And again, this is in no way. You know, I, I played with him for twenty years here in De La Salle, and you know, I, I just think you know he was a he was a special kind of an assassin. You know, he had that ability to. You know, he had serious battles with, with Brian Murphy and Pat Mulcahy and The Rock, etc. with, with Don Logue's crowd. And he had serious battles with, with, with Ollie Canning and all the best cornerbacks. And he had that ability to be able to come from behind. You know, I often ask people down in Watford about John. What was his most kind of, you know, what was the trait that made him so dangerous? And it was his ability to be able to be behind you as a cornerback and then all of a sudden come out in front of you. So another fellow would be so obsessed to get out in front because they might think they're going to be caught on the legs. But he had a great ability to be able to start from behind and then either come out left or right from behind you. And then, obviously, his overhead strike on his left-hand side. So, I think in terms of the, the points scored from play, I think he has five All-Stars, if I think I'm right, because we, we organised a night for him in the club there a couple of years ago. And, five. and I think in 2008, he was robbed of an All-Star, if I'm completely honest, in terms of the, 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 the trip to the final. I think he got five points from play against Cipriari in the semi-final. He got five points on a losing team against Kilkenny in the All Ireland final. So I would I would feel that John No no can you play four and a half full four then? <laughs> 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 no, we, we never caught so up. That's the fact. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're like me, you play none you play none and if I have full four then <laughs> <laughs> you just put them all out to the middle of the field and you, you can call it sweeper and then get whatever you want to call it. But anyway um yeah did look he, I think, did, he get, did he get man of the match as well in the 2003 Munster final, even though Watford were beaten, because he scored a hat-trick, I think, that day. As I, the reason I remember it was, I was standing on the town end terrace, and I, I distinctly remember him using those the other way around, because <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think the Cork support, we, Cork were kind of quite far ahead at the time. And if, I, if I don't know, you might remember this, as, a, as you were in goal, obviously. I think like, the Cork support had gotten slightly giddy, and maybe an old rendition of the banks had broke out across the town and terrace in Tarlis. And next thing he banged in another goal and he ran over to kind of tell us what he thought. Oh, listen, it was, yeah, he got, he got a bit that, was the of the that was the 2003 was the final, Rory. I know the war was left, he thinks that the 2004 was the only one that ever took place, right? But there was, <laughs> so was in 2003 as well. The, uh, but, but he did, and I remember it as well because I was uh, obviously. He was putting it past me. And he look, he enamored himself to, to Cork fans over the next couple of years. Cork but again, Cork support that, 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 yeah, that, that all just added to the whole thing. Like, you know, he was one of those great characters. And I think even like myself, the more you got to, to see him and the more you got to realize 
you know, how good and what a special talent he was. And he, he always had, I think the best inside forwards must always have goal on their minds. And whenever John Milan got the ball, even if he was in the half forward position, you always felt that he had goal on, on, on his mind at all times. Yeah. Mm. Go on, Derek. Okay, so you're putting in the brother-in-law who's alongside him. I'm putting in Owen Kelly as well. I stay with Owen Kelly uh, uh, on the grounds of living with expectation and just the whole, uh, the means of which he, he, he um, dealt with all that expectation and just the warrior-like qualities he had and just a serious, serious horror. Um, so I'll have Milan, I'll have Owen Kelly and I'll actually, I'll book the trend here and I'll go again with, with Patrick Horgan. And, and I'm leaving out, <laughs> as I said, brilliant players in, in Callan and Nicky English and probably have no justification, but I just, watching <laughs> Horgan, watching Horgan, even, even from a management point of view, over the years, um, the five years I was involved with, with Waterford, you know, invariably we, we, we put Noel Connors on them to de- detail Noel Connors to him, then we detailed Shane Fives in the semi-final at 17 and just watching what Horgan has done over the last three or four years. Jesus, he, he's just a genius. I, I just think he's, he's, he's a genius, you know, and, and I get a real sense of joy when, when he's playing as well. You know, that real sense of kind of, kind of not laziness, now that's the wrong word, but a mixture of kind of a throwback David Ginola type, uh, you know, soccer player type, you know, expressing himself and, and yet a kind of a rootlessness as well, you know, and, and just a beautiful striker the ball. So I'm going to book the trend and go Milan, Owen Kelly and Patrick Horgan. And as I said, all, all, are, all are completely open for, for debate, as I said, but you have to nail your colours to the mast at some stage. Right, so I don't know, I'm interested here, obviously, your team. Patrick Horgan, I just want to mention for a minute, because I agree he's, not just because we've got two Corkman on this call and you like him too, but um, he's fascinating. Everything about him is like he's, you know, car- he's been carrying the scoring burden for so long. He's a um, tremendous free taker. But what always fascinated me about him, Donald Ogue, is the fact that he's incredibly skillful and, uh, as we say, wristy hurler. But by all accounts, he, he uh, plays with a tree trunk. His hurl is the heaviest you could imagine. And, like, you've seen some of the skills videos he's put out on his social media. He's doing things with hurls if it was a table tennis bat. And we all know that it weighs the same as, you know, a mahogany side table. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember often looking at Hoggy's hurlies and saying, geez, like, he actually makes some of his own hurlies. Mm. He, He's got fierce, powerful wrists yes. that Horgan has, right? So, like, and again, that's not an uncommon team against or amongst uh, some top players, right? That gives him gives him that control. Even if you look at his hands, the next time you see an image of him, you can see you can see that power that exists in in his hands. the The only person I'm going to throw into the conversation outside of everybody that that that's mentioned there, right? And they like the likes of John Milan, Hoggy. Kellen, Kelly, those four were in my, my, my top six, right? The only person I'm going to put in there is Joe Dean, okay? And again, maybe maybe a bit of bias here. Grew up with Joe, same age as him, all, all the ways up. But, like, if you're looking for uh, a top-class player, top-class finisher, Joe never missed a handy one. That was always what was in my, my mind. Sometimes you'd see even great players going across the square and they might miss hit the ball, it might go away. I can never remember Joe getting a chance and not being able to, 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 to take the chance. And like he was so economical, was very physical as well. Again, a, a common theme. And, and, a small, and a small guy, like, you know. That's it. Just shows you don't have to, you don't have to be six foot three to be a great forward, and including in, in, in the modern game. That's a fact. Look at Christy Ring. Christy Ring was only five foot eight and he was the greatest of them all. The, um, mm. going, back to, going back to Joe, I think he's the one fella out of all those that deserves to be mentioned with all of those great names that have uh, 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 gone, gone before us. Is he in your full forward line then, Don Log? I had, I, I went for, I went for uh, Hoggy with John Milan, being very unlucky. I went for Kelly with Kellen, being very unlucky. And I went for Joe on the other corner. This is hard to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> good day, so I love it. Uh, yeah. good well, you've, you, you, the two of you have uh, re- readdressed the uh, the obvious Tipperary bias that we have in the uh, podcast uh, in the in the vote there. But I don't think we're going to change things. As I said, it's it's, no, it's no. Just 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 if I could mention because look, I suppose I mean who cares about what what what? Like, I, I, again, my choice. But I suppose even just trying to be somewhere. 
uh, representative across the ages. There's one player that I remember my father used to always talk about, like he reckoned he was a genius, but maybe we didn't see enough of him. Was Eamon Cregan from Limerick? Now I don't, I, I personally didn't see enough of him, but like the reverence with which that he is held by a certain generation, I, you know, I, pres- I you can only take their word for it. But JVM was kind of, I suppose. Reality is Jimmy Barry Murphy was a lot of Cork people, a lot of young lads in Cork, but he would have been the hero for that. I'm surprised that he, you know, because there would be a lot of affection for Jimmy as well, that he mm. didn't manage to take it in. Certainly at 14, five All Irelands, whatever else he won. So it just, you know, where would the lads fall on JBM and what, you know, his stature in the game? For some reason, they always. So some of the highlights we see of Jimmy being, uh, I definitely think he should be in the top six in the forward line. But for some reason, I, as I said, even though some of the highlights we see maybe around 1984, 86, when he was playing at full forward, I always thought Jimmy, from what I've seen, would actually be better, better half forward than uh, in that position. If you look at Nicky, Nicky was more of a full forward. Ray Cummins was a kind of, you know, an out and out full forward. If you throw that, throw that name out there, Jimmy just strikes me as a guy that would nearly be more dangerous out in the half forward line. Mm. Yeah, well, he's one of those, uh, he, not a jack of all trades, that's an insult to say of him, but you know, he's one of those players who certainly, we've had a few of them on this team who could play across a number of lines and it actually has tended to kind of damage them to an extent where um, people don't seem to be able to, Ken McGraw's another example, be able to settle on where exactly they might be placed and I think it, it harms their vote. But listen, that's... And it- this, on. Just one last thing, sorry, Mikey, and I just because again, I'd just be very interested in, in all in all in all three of your views. Somebody who I think has the potential to become an all-time great, and it's just a pity that we might be robbed of seeing him in action again this year because I think he's only approaching his prime. But in terms of skills coming out of his gills, is Aaron Galan. Where where would you see the potential there, lads? I had a couple of fellas like that in it, Rory. I, I the, the players I played against, which was more than half of those, the players I hadn't played against. Um, and under that bucket that came afterwards, I John McGrath, Aaron Gillan, I, I the two of those in kind of that similar type territory. That if someone's having this conversation in 20 years' time, I think Gillan, I've said it before, that if there was a transfer market out there, I'd be, I'd be, I, he'd be uh, uh, very close, if not on the top of my list, anyway. Yeah, oh, he's, he's a tremendous player. And just uh, like a lot of that Limerick team, uh, Derek, unpredictable. You know, you, you couldn't pigeonhole what he's going to do when he gets the ball. He's got that kind of little touch of je ne sais quoi about him, hasn't he? Yeah, and he has, he has what we've all referred to over the last two years. He has the ability to operate one against two, one against three, which is, which is where most teams are now. Even when you go to pick conventional corner forwards for a team in 10 years' time, you know, who, who, who would have said 10 years ago that John McGrath would be hooking Walter Welch on the goal line for, in the All-Ireland final this year in the first play of the All-Ireland, you know, as a corner forward. So it has changed and it has evolved around that. So... I think Ganan has, like, I, I, when, you're, when you're kind of assessing this, you're kind of saying to yourself, what team are actually playing three conventional full forwards now? And there's actually no team. There's actually no team. You know, there's actually no team playing a 13, 14, and 15 inside the 21. Invariably, teams are playing a one in there, two in there. You know, one for this wander, one for this in the middle of the field, one for this whatever. So, you know, so I think that's where Ganan stands out. He ha- he's, the out ball for Ganan, invariably, is a ball where he's one against two, but he's in the area where he's more likely to win it. And that's a special skill. Plus, he has that innate ability to win it in behind in the air, which only, you know, Johnny Glynn has it for Galway. And there's not too many people that have the ability to win it in behind. John Donnelly is rebooted really for Kilkenny, you know, as a modern forward. You know, that ability to win it in, in the air and behind. And uh, Galan has it. He's, he's, he's the full package, really, you know. Yeah. All right, lads. Um, very interesting discussion, as I knew it would be. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'd like to mention that there's plenty of news and analysis, RIGA wise and otherwise, on the RT website and the News Now app. And Rory, uh, what is coming up this Sunday? Sunday game, yeah, this Sunday, half nine. Um, special one on one with Sean Ogahalpine, which I'm sure Don Logue will be looking forward to watching. And there's, um, there's, there's, there, they'll be looking with a bit of football in there, Ross Common and Galway. Look back, possibly Cork Limerick, a sore one from our point of view, the 2018 semi final. And um, yeah, and like you know, a fair bit more, so it should be good again, you know. Okay, Plenty of- and we obviously have Sunday Sport on Radio One from two o'clock on Sunday. So please do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. And just like to say thank you to Derek and to Don Logue and to Rory, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cheers. Guys. Cheers. Cheers. 
Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses.